Welcome to another episode of Critical Role Demystified. Today we're talking about the seventh episode of the Vox Machina campaign, The Throne Room. Travis is not present for this episode or for the next episode, but other than that we have a full house. And this episode opens with the party sneaking through the Duragar Fortress, looking for the vault where Lady Kima's holy vestments are being held. I'm not going to go through every small encounter that they deal with, because a lot of them, they don't even roll for initiative, they're very quick. But here's a couple of highlights. Vax stealths ahead of the rest of the group, usually to the chagrin of the other party members, who often just end up following him anyway. Lady Kima seems restless and antsy, but when they get to the smithy they find some basic armor and weapons to give her, and she seems a little calmer after that. Percy knocks a Dwargar unconscious, and then Pike slits his throat, the Dwargar's throat, not Percy's throat, with her mace. And Matt rolls with it, but he does imply that it was a little bit... evil? And that'll come into play in the next episode. He is incapacitated. So can I go up to him and slit his throat with my mace of disruption? Whoa! You, you can I make sure he's dead? If you'd like to. Yes, oh. I want to. Okay. <laughs> That's really bad. Is that really bad, though? Pike, Pike, Pike walks up and grabs the back oh, wait, of Durgar's hair, pulls it back, and using the jagged edge of her mace of disruption, tears open the throat of the Durgars, then spills bad. all bad this guys. blackish ichor across the ground. She's going renegade, folks. She's going renegade. Um, I just wanted to make sure he didn't come after us. Gro Grog yeah, looks family. impressed, and but also slightly worried as the men who no grew up alongside you. Um, all right, so that happened. Also, Scanlan poops in a bed. Maybe wait there. Scanlan, you staying in that room? I'm taking a dump on the guest bed. <laughs> if, if that's a thing that does anything for you, that's a thing that happens. They investigate a dining room, but then the doors shut behind them, locking out Keyleth, Grog, and Tiberius, and trapping the rest of the party in the dark in a room with a mind flayer. Several of the party members are stunned, but the others still manage to put up a pretty good fight and force the mind flayer to flee. But that means that the bad guys unambiguously know that the party is in the fortress. I mean, that was already true, but now they really know. And then following this, as they're exploring the fortress, Matt leaves the battle music running. Ordinarily for an exploration scene or a stealth scene, he would go to a different playlist. But here he's trying to keep the tension up so the party understands how under the gun they are. However, the music is kind of crackly, so we're not going to have a ton of clips from this section of the episode. They divide up, which actually helps them clear rooms much faster, and it helps them move through the hallways much more easily. They were getting fairly jammed up in the first part of the episode, and in the episode before. There's a reason Grog was the only one who could get into the torture room. These hallways are kind of limiting for a party of eight, plus two NPCs, plus a bear. Throughout this journey, they also get electrocuted and poisoned by several traps that go off in their faces. They find an altar of worship with some viscera laid out upon it, and a statue to the dwarven deity, Leduger. Leduger! Tiberius makes sure to examine the statue for potential future uses. They briefly fight with a Durgar mage before overpowering him and intimidating him, and then he tells them about the big trap waiting for them upstairs. The Durgar is pressed against the wall now, and she's slamming him against the back of a bookshelf, and he, uh, look! All right, they're waiting for you up there. Ooh. All right, you're not gonna survive this. At this point, the entire city's probably waiting for you on the outside of the fortress, and those that are upstairs are well prepared, okay? Your best chance of survival is laying on your arms and surrendering. Oh, I'm yeah. looking out for your best interest here. They debate whether to stay and fight or cut their losses and leave. But Kima insists that the villains upstairs have to be dealt with. And it's not about Kima getting her holy items from the vault. She pretty much admits that's not going to happen at this point. But the king and queen of the Duragar are evil. I mean, looking at Lady Kima's brand new scars in progress, she's got evidence of this. Plus, if Vox Machina presses forward into the Underdark without dealing with the Duragar threat, Durgar could come up behind them and flank them with the Mind Flayers, and it could be really, really bad, actually. Grog pours them all a toast and empties his cask of ale. We'll come back to this in a later episode, but even just a few episodes from now, it's actually kind of hard to imagine that happening while a player was missing. The idea that a character under Matt's control would voluntarily give up some of their possessions. Although I believe it actually did happen once in Campaign 2 as well, so let's consider it the exception and not the norm after a while. Vox Machina suggests splitting up their forces and making a distraction, so some members can sneak in while others cause a big disturbance. They land on a plan, they're all going to sneak up to the throne room where all of the enemies are waiting. 
Then Keyleth will enter the room in the form of a giant scorpion, and Tiberius on her back in the form of Leduger, the Duragar god. Pike will use her thaumaturgy spell to enhance Tiberius' voice and give him a more godly effect. On the way upstairs, they dispatch a few guards using a combination of watery sphere, call lightning, and vicious mockery. Because when you have a bard in the party, every once in a while, you have to describe how vicious mockery causes a bard to insult an enemy to death. d and a little weird sometimes. You ugly, you ugly, your mama says you ugly. So, as, as the Durgar is currently held aloft in this aquatic sphere, half charred and burnt with pieces of his friends floating, in the water around him, he hears through this kind of warbling sound, you ugly, you ugly. <laughs> and he sees everyone kind of step out in the hallway clapping with you, and he kind of looks around himself, looks at his situation, and eventually just gives up and takes a big old gulp of water and drowns in the side of the aquatic sea. Yes. Tiberius and Keyleth burst into the Duragar throne room, which is populated by the king and queen of the Duragar, several soldiers, some pet basilisks, and that mind flayer. And they attempt to intimidate the Duragar into submitting or surrendering. However, the king is no fool, so combat kicks off pretty quickly. Here's a few highlights. Vax is an assassin rogue and he acts before the mind flayer. So he does a ton of damage to the Illithid, but does not actually manage to bring it down before the Illithid's turn. The queen is revealed to be a sorcerer who can do some awesome cool magic stuff. Tiberius and Kima are turned to stone by basilisks. Clarota dominates the Mind Flayer and turns it against the Duragar Queen. Vex gets a really good hit on the Queen and she's starting to look a little rough. So she takes her opportunity to brainwash Grog and dominate him. Puts her hand up towards him as he's pulling his axe back angrily. He fails his save and he puts his axe back down and looks towards the rest of the group. Oh no! no! Not again! And then she casts Disintegrate on the ceiling, releasing a flow of magma that begins to stream down into the center of the throne room. My love, I'm sorry, but there's much more work to be done. Oh. And she raises her hand up and you see this buildup of green arcane energy at her hand. She turns it towards the rest of the group, uh... faces it up towards the ceiling and releases this pulse of arcane green ill-looking energy that blasts into the stone ceiling. As it does, the stone itself disintegrates in a large chunk. Oh no. And a glowing mass of seeping hot molten magma begins to pour. Oh shit! Clarota drags Lady Kima out of the room immediately, sending a signal to the players, hey, it's time to go. Smart move, Matt, well played. Keyleth uses her wind powers to cool the lava just long enough for another round of combat to play out inside the throne room. The enemy Mind Flayer teleports away again. Scanlan draws his sword for what is like one of the only three times he ever pulls out his sword during the entire campaign and cuts the king's head clean off with a natural 20. The queen takes Grog with her as she dimension doors out of the room and possibly out of the fortress entirely. And the magma continues to fill the room, no longer able to be cooled and deterred by the wind powers of Keyleth. She looks over at, at you, who's stabbed her the arrows in her abdomen, and she looks up at Grog and says, ah, We've got business elsewhere. No! And no, she reaches out and no, touches no, 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 Grog. No. Both of them shoo, blink oh, out dimension fuck. door. We lost what? Grog again! A very familiar, again. very familiar purplish color, as you've seen, you cast it, the dimension door out of the entire vicinity. Ah, son of a. Buh. This is the second time we've lost At which Grog. point, the stone rocks crack on the column and the magma now goes into full pour. We gotta get out! You guys have to get out of that tunnel. What do you do now? What's we the run. process? They get some basilisk blood into a vial to cure their friends in the future. And then they drag their stone friends down the stairs. Ouch. Well, they don't feel it. It's fine. And get them to the secret door that the party used to enter the fortress. Lava fills the stairs behind them and splashes against them just as they get through the doors. And Vax gets knocked unconscious the hefty force of magma comes funneling down into the room and splashes across the floor. Oh, that's a lot of dice. There's a lot of dice. There's a lot of dice. There's a lot of dice. Oh, stop oh God, that. There's so many dice. The party members pull Vax out of the lava, but his foot is pretty well melted. It's not gone, but it is smoother than it was. Less, um, less things sticking off of it that he could wiggle. They heal him and bring him back to consciousness, but his foot is still burned, and that will take time to heal. And of course, Grog is gone, with the bag of holding and the flying carpet. And they have no idea where he is or where the other escaped enemies have gone to. That's the end of the session. 
So let's get into the lesson. I'll be honest, while watching the beginning of this episode, probably about the first half of the episode, I wasn't really sure how much I'd have to talk about in this one. I mean, maybe there's something to talk about regarding buy-in from the table as some players want to sneak off ahead, but others don't want to feel left behind. There's a conversation to be had another day about buy-in and managing expectations, but ultimately that's going to be a topic for another day. Because in this episode, Matt does something that might seem obvious to lots of you, but it's something I almost always forget to have my villains do. In fact, he does it three times across two different fights. Matt has his villains retreat. The Mind Flayer retreats from the first fight in the Feast Hall, and then in the throne room, both the Mind Flayer and the Queen retreat in two separate turns, two separate actions. And all of them do so with magic teleportation. And listen, I'm not above having an enemy teleport away when I want to keep a major villain alive for a little bit longer in the campaign. But the Mind Flayer is not a major villain. The Queen arguably isn't a major villain either, unless you were to ask Kima. Looking back in the history of this campaign, the most memorable thing the Queen does is what she does in this episode, taking Grog and bailing and leaving a lava fall for our heroes to deal with. But it actually doesn't matter if they're intended to be major ongoing villains or not. They're both intelligent creatures. And once the fight starts to turn against them, there's no reason for them to stick around and fight until their last breath. So they run. But they don't even just run. The Mind Flayer retreats to tell the other enemies about the party's presence. And then all of those enemies prepare for the party in one location. At the end of the episode, both the Mind Flayer and the Queen make a full retreat, but they take Grog with them. Which might have been done because Matt knew that Travis wasn't going to be able to be at the next game. Or it was done because the Queen is a smart NPC and Matt has his villains act tactically. It's hard to know for sure. I've run so many fights where my villains stay and fight the good guys until they get themselves killed. Even once the odds have been fully turned against them, they still stay and fight. And I need to remember that retreat is always an option. Also, Matt does another smart trick here in relation to retreating. When magma begins to flow into the room, Clarota immediately grabs onto Lady Kima and starts pulling her out the door. This sends a signal to the players that they should really consider retreating, because they will not be able to stay in this room much longer. This cuts through the challenges that always seem to arise when D&D groups talk about or consider retreating. Usually, nobody wants to be the first one out the door. The ones most willing to retreat are almost always the same ones who are willing to hang back and cover their friends long enough for everyone to get out of the room. Which means that even though they're the ones who most want to retreat, they also kind of want to be the last one in the room. And the rest of the players inevitably always want to get just one more hit in before they run. Heck, that's what Scanlan does with the king, and it actually works. But Matt uses Clarota to break the seal. And now the party is planning to retreat. While I don't necessarily advise using your NPCs to offer obvious suggestions about what the party should do, because that really shouldn't be the reason the NPCs are with the party, it is a nice trick to be able to use an NPC to put an idea like this onto the table, because it cuts through some of the strange eccentricities of player psychology, and their general unwillingness to retreat. But honestly, the most important thing Matt does in this episode is have his villains retreat, because it shapes the direction of the entire next two sessions. And it's a lesson I could really stand to remember in my own games. Thank you so much for watching. We will be back in two weeks for episode eight, Glass and Bone. It offers us another chance to see a truly homebrewed Matt Mercer monster. And that is a ton of fun. Thank you again for watching. If you want to support the channel, there are four great ways to do that. You can subscribe and ring the bell. That sends YouTube a message to say that, hey, I liked this channel. The like button does that too. But really, subscribing and ringing the bell has a major impact. You can join my Patreon, any dollar amount helps. You get awesome rewards for only $3 a month. You can join my Patreon only live streams. The next one of those is on Sunday, July 17th. You get to see these videos a couple of days early and you get some exclusive D&D content that you can drop right into your game. The third way you can support the channel is by joining the Discord. There are some cool people hanging out there and we'd love to have you be one of those cool people. I mean, we already know that you're a cool person, but you know, come meet the other cool people. And you can sign up for my newsletter and get occasional updates about the things I've got going on. The links for all of those are in the doobly-doo below. Come check them out. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, play fair and have fun.